As a Man Thinketh by James Allen Narrated by Ryan Shanahan Forward Mind is the master power that molds and makes, and man is mind, and evermore he takes the tools of thought, and shaping what he wills, brings forth a thousand joys and a thousand ills. He thinks in secret, and it comes to pass, environment is his looking-glass. This little volume, the result of meditation and experience, is not intended as an exhaustive treatise on the much-written-upon subject of the power of thought. It is suggestive rather than explanatory, its object being to stimulate men and women to the discovery and perception of the truth they themselves are makers of themselves, by virtue of the thoughts which they choose and encourage, that mind is the master weaver both of the inner garment of character and of the outer garment of circumstance, and that, as they may hitherto woven in ignorance and pain, they may now weave in enlightenment and happiness. James Allen Thought and Character The aphorism, as a man thinketh in his heart, so he is, not only embraces the whole of man's being, but is so comprehensive as to reach out to every condition and circumstance of his life. A man is literally what he thinks, his character being the complete sum of all his thoughts. As the plant springs from and could not be without the seed, so every act of man springs from the hidden seeds of thought, and could not have appeared without them. This applies equally to those acts called spontaneous and unpremeditated, so to those which are deliberately executed. Act in the blossom of thought, and joy and suffering are its fruits. Thus does a man garner in the sweet and bitter fruitage of his own husbandry. Thought in the mind hath made us. What we are by thought are wrought and built. If a man's mind hath evil thoughts, pain comes on him as comes the wheel of the ox behind. If one endure in purity of thought, joy follows him as his own shadow, sure. The Dhammapada. Man is a growth by law, and not a creation by artifice, and cause and effect are as absolute and undeviating in the hidden realm of thought as in the world of visible and material things. A noble and godlike character is not a thing of favor or chance, but is the natural result of continued effort in right thinking, the effect of long-cherished association with godlike thoughts. An ignoble and bestial character by the same process is the result of the continued harboring of groveling thoughts. Man is made or unmade by himself. In the armory of thought he fogs the weapons by which he destroys himself. He also fashions the tools with which he builds for himself heavenly mansions of joy and strength and peace. By the right choice and true application of thought, man ascends to the divine perfection. By the abuse and wrong application of thought, he descends below the level of the beast. Between these two extremes are all the grades of character, and man is their maker and master. Of all the beautiful truths pertaining to the soul which have been restored and brought to light in this age, none is more gladdening or fruitful of divine promise and confidence than this, that man is the master of thought, the molder of character, and the maker and shaper of condition, environment, and destiny. As a being of power, intelligence, and love, and the lord of his own thoughts, man holds the key to every situation and contains within himself that transforming and regenerative agency by which he may make himself what he wills. Man is always the master, even in his weakness and most abandoned state. But in his weakness and degradation he is the foolish master who misgoverns his household. When he begins to reflect upon his condition and search diligently for the law upon which his being is established, he then becomes the wise master, directing his energies with intelligence and fashioning his thoughts to fruitful issues. Such is the conscious master, and man can only thus become, by discovering within himself the laws of thought, which discovery is totally a matter of application, self-analysis, and experience. Only by much searching and mining are gold and diamonds obtained, and man can find every truth connected with his being, if he will dig deep in the mine of his soul, and that he is the maker of his character, the molder of his life, and the builder of his destiny, he may unerringly prove, if he will watch, control, and alter his thoughts, tracing their effects upon himself, upon others, and upon his life and circumstances, linking cause and effect by patient practice and investigation. 
and utilizing his every experience, even the most trivial, everyday occurrence, as a means of obtaining the knowledge of himself, which is understanding, wisdom, power. In this direction, as in no other, is the law absolute, that he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. For only by patience, practice, and ceaseless importunity can a man enter the door of the temple of knowledge. Section 2. Effect of Thought on Circumstances A man's mind may be likened to a garden, which may be intelligently cultivated or allowed to run wild. But whether cultivated or neglected, it must and will bring forth. If no useful seeds are put into it, then an abundance of useless weed seeds will fall therein and will continue to produce their kind. Just as a gardener cultivates his plot, keeping it free from weeds and growing the flowers and fruits which he requires, so may a man tend the garden of his mind, weeding out all the wrong, useless and impure thoughts, and cultivating towards perfection the flowers and fruits of right, useful and pure thoughts. By pursuing this process, a man sooner or later discovers that he is the master gardener of his soul, the director of his life. He also reveals within himself the flaws and thoughts and understands with ever-increasing accuracy how the thought forces and mind elements operate in the shaping of his character, circumstances, and destiny. Thought and character are one, and as character can only manifest and discover itself through environment and circumstances, the outer conditions of a person's life will always be found to be harmoniously related to his inner state. This does not mean that a man's circumstances at any given time are an indication of his entire character but that those circumstances are so intimately connected with some vital thought element within himself that for time being they are indispensable to his development. Every man is where he is by the law of his being. The thoughts by which he has built his character have brought him there, and in the agreement of his life there is no element of chance, but all is the result of a law which cannot err. This is just as true of those who feel out of harmony with their surroundings as of those who are contented with them. As a progressive and evolving being, man is where he is, that he may learn, that he may grow, and as he learns the spiritual lessons which any circumstance contains for him, it passes away and gives place to other circumstances. Man is buffeted by circumstances, so long as he believes himself a creature of outside conditions, but when he realizes that he is a creative power, and that he may command the hidden soil and seeds of his being, out of which circumstances grow, he then becomes the rightful master of himself. That circumstances grow out of thought, every man knows who has for any length of time practiced self-control and self-purification, for he will have noticed that the alterations of his circumstances has been in exact ratio with his altered mental condition. So true is this that when a man earnestly applies himself to remedy the defects in his character and makes swift and marked progress, he passes rapidly through a succession of vicissitudes. The soul attracts that which it secretly harbors, that which it loves, and also that which it fears. It reaches the heights of its cherished aspirations. It falls to the level of its unchastened desires. And circumstances are the means by which the soul receives its own. Every thought, seed, sown, or allowed to fall into the mind, and to take root there, produces its own, blossoming sooner or later into act, and bearing its own fruitage of opportunity and circumstance. Good thoughts bear good fruit, bad thoughts bad fruit. The outer world of circumstances shapes itself to the inner world of thought, and both pleasant and unpleasant external conditions are factors which make for the ultimate good of the individual. As the reaper of his own harvest, man learns both of suffering and bliss, following the innermost desires, aspirations, thoughts, by which he allows himself to be dominated, pursuing the will of the wisps of impure imaginations, or steadfastly walking the highways of strong and high endeavors, a man at last arrives at their fruition and fulfillment in the outer conditions of his life, the laws of growth and adjustments everywhere obtain. A man does not come to the alms-house or the jail by the tyranny of fate or circumstances, but by the pathway of groveling thoughts and base desires. Nor does a pure-minded man fall suddenly into crime by stress of any mere external force. The criminal thought had only been secretly fostered in the heart, and the hour of opportunity revealed its gathered power. Circumstance does not make the man, it reveals him to himself. 
No such conditions can exist as descending into vice and its attending sufferings apart from vicious inclinations, or ascending into virtue and its pure happiness without the continued cultivation of virtuous aspirations. And man, therefore, as the Lord and Master of thought, is the maker of himself, the shaper and author of environment. Even at birth the soul comes to its own, and through every step of its earthly pilgrimage it attracts those combinations of conditions which reveal itself, which are the reflections of its own purity and impurity, its strength and weakness. Men do not attract to that which they want, but that which they are. Their whims, fancies, ambitions are thwarted at every step by their inmost thoughts, and desires are fed by their own food, be it foul or clean. The divinity that shapes our ends is in ourselves. It is our very self. Man is manacled only by himself. Thought and action are the jailers of fate. They imprison, being base. They are also the angels of freedom. They liberate, being noble. Not what he wishes and prays for does a man get, but what he justly earns. His wishes and prayers are only gratified and answered when they harmonize with his thoughts and actions. In the light of this truth, what then is the meaning of fighting against circumstances? It means that a man is continually revolting against an effect without, while all the time he is nourishing and preserving its cause in his heart. The cause may take the form of a conscious vice or an unconscious weakness, but whatever it is, it stubbornly retards the efforts of its possessor and thus calls aloud for remedy. Men are anxious to improve their circumstances, but are unwilling to improve themselves. They therefore remained bound. The man who does not shrink from self-crucifixion can never fail to accomplish the object upon which his heart is set. This is as true of earthly as of heavenly things. Even the man whose sole object is to acquire wealth must be prepared to make great personal sacrifice before he can accomplish his object, and how much more so he who would realize a strong and well-poised life. Here is a man who is wretchedly poor, he is extremely anxious that his surroundings and home comforts should be improved, yet all the time he shrinks his work and considers he is justified in trying to deceive his employer on the ground of the insufficiency of his wages. Such a man does not understand the simplest rudiment of those principles which are the basis of true prosperity, and is not only totally unfitted to rise up out of his wretchedness, but is actually attracting to himself a still deeper wretchedness by dwelling in and acting out indolent, deceptive, and unmanly thoughts. Here is a rich man who is the victim of a painful and persistent disease as the result of gluttony. He is willing to give large sums of money to get rid of it, but he will not sacrifice his taste for rich and unnatural viands and have his health because he has not yet learned the first principle of a healthy life. Here is an employer of labor who adopts crooked measures to avoid paying a regulation wage, and in the hope of making larger profits reduces the wages of his work people. Such a man is altogether unfitted for prosperity, and when he finds himself bankrupt, both as regards reputation and riches, he blames circumstances, not knowing that he is the sole author of his condition. I have introduced these three cases merely as illustrative of the truth that man is the cause, though nearly always unconsciously, of his circumstances and that, while aiming at a good end, he is continually frustrating his accomplishment by encouraging thoughts and desires which cannot possibly harmonize with that end. Such cases could be multiplied and varied almost indefinitely, as the reader or listener can, if he so resolves, trace the action of the laws of thought in his own mind and life, and until this is done, mere external facts cannot serve as a ground of reasoning. Circumstances, however, are so complicated thought is so deeply rooted, and the conditions of happiness vary so vastly with individuals that a man's entire soul, although it may be known to himself, cannot be judged by another from the external aspect of his life alone. A man may be honest in certain directions, yet suffer privations, and man may be dishonest in certain directions, yet acquire wealth. But the conclusion usually forms that the one man failed because of his particular honesty, and that the other prospers because of his particular dishonesty, is the result of a superficial judgment, which assumes that the dishonest man is almost totally corrupt, and the honest man almost entirely virtuous. In the light of a deeper knowledge and wider experience, such a judgment is found to be erroneous. 
the dishonest man may have some admirable virtues which the other does not possess and the honest man's obnoxious vices which are absent in the other the honest man reaps the good results of his honest thoughts and acts he also brings upon himself the suffering which his vices produce the dishonest man likewise garners his own suffering and happiness it is pleasing to human vanity to believe that one suffers because of one's virtue but not until a man has extirpated every sickly bitter and impure thought from his soul can he be in position to know and declare that his sufferings are the result of his good and not of his bad qualities yet long before he has reached that supreme perfection he will have found working in his mind and life the great law which is absolutely just and which cannot therefore give good for evil evil for good Possessed of such knowledge, he will then know, looking back upon his past ignorance and blindness, that his life is and always was justly ordered, and that all his past experiences, good and bad, were the equitable outworking of his evolving yet unevolving self. Good thoughts and actions can never produce bad results. Bad thoughts and actions can never produce good results. This is but saying that nothing can come from corn but corn, nothing come from nettles but nettles, Men understand this law in the natural world and work with it, but few understand it in the mental and moral world, though its operation there is just as simple and undeviating, and they therefore do not cooperate with it. Suffering is always the effect of wrong thoughts in some direction. It is an indication that the individual is out of harmony with himself, with the law of his being. The sole and supreme use of suffering is to purify, to burn out all that is useless and impure, suffering ceases for him who is pure there could be no object in burning gold after the dross has been removed and a perfectly pure and enlightened being could not suffer the circumstances which a man encounters with suffering are the result of his own mental inharmony the circumstances which a man encounters with blessedness are the result of his own mental harmony blessedness not material possession is the measure of right thoughts wretchedness not lack of material possessions is the measure of wrong thought. A man may be cursed and rich. He may be blessed and poor. Blessedness and richness are only joined together when the riches are rightly and wisely used, and the poor man only descends into wretchedness when he regards his lot as a burden unjustly imposed. Indigence and indulgence are the two extremes of wretchedness. They are both equally unnatural and the result of mental disorder. A man is not rightly conditioned until he is a happy, healthy, and prosperous being, and happiness, health, and prosperity are the result of a harmonious adjustment of the inner with the outer, of the man with his surroundings. A man only begins to be a man when he ceases to whine and revile, and commences to search for the hidden justice which regulate his life, and as he adapts his mind to that regulating factor, he ceases to accuse others as the cause of his condition and builds himself up in strong and noble thoughts, ceases to kick against circumstances, but begins to use them as aids to his more rapid progress, and as a means of discovering the hidden powers and possibilities within himself. Law, not confusion, is the dominating principle in the universe. Justice, not injustice, is the soul of substance and life. Righteousness, not corruption, is the molding and moving force in the spiritual government of the world. This being so, man has but to right himself, to find that the universe is right, and during the process of putting himself right, he will find that as he alters his thoughts towards things and other people, things and other people will alter towards him. The proof of this truth is in every person, and it therefore admits of easy investigation by systematic introspection and self-analysis. Let a man radically alter his thoughts, and he will be astonished at the rapid transformation it will effect in the material conditions of his life. Men imagine that thought can be kept secret. It rapidly crystallizes into habit, and habit solidifies into circumstances. These steel thoughts crystallize into habits of drunkenness and sensuality, which solidify into circumstances of destitution and disease. Impure thoughts of every kind crystallize into enervating and confusing habits, which solidify into distracting and adverse circumstances. Thoughts of fear, doubt, and indecision crystallize into weak, unmanly, and irresolute habits, which solidify into circumstances of failure, indigence, and lavish dependence. 
lazy thoughts crystallize into habits of uncleanliness and dishonesty, which solidify into circumstances of foulness and beggary. Hateful and condemnatory thoughts crystallize into habits of accusation and violence, which solidify into circumstances of injury and persecution. Selfish thoughts of all kinds crystallize into habits of self-seeking, which solidify into circumstances more or less distressing. On the other hand, beautiful thoughts of all kinds crystallize into habits of grace and kindliness, which solidify into genial and sunny circumstances. Pure thoughts crystallize into habits of temperance and self-control, which solidify into circumstances of repose and peace. Thoughts of courage, self-reliance, and decision crystallize into manly habits, which solidify into circumstances of success, plenty, and freedom. Energetic thoughts crystallize into habits of cleanliness and industry, which solidify into circumstances of pleasantness. Gentle and forgiving thoughts crystallize into habits of gentleness, which solidify into protective and preservative circumstances. Loving and useful thoughts crystallize into habits of self-forgiveness, which solidify into circumstances of sure and abiding prosperity and true riches. A particular train of thought persisted in, be it good or bad, cannot fail to produce its results of the character and circumstances. A man cannot directly choose his circumstances, but he can choose his thoughts, and so indirectly, yet surely, shape his circumstances. Nature helps every man to the gratification of the thoughts which he most encourages, and opportunities are presented which will most speedily bring to the surface both the good and the evil thoughts. Let a man cease from his sinful thoughts, and all the world will soften towards him. Let him put away his weakly and sickly thoughts, and the opportunities will spring up on every hand to aid his strong resolve. Let him encourage good thoughts, and no hard fate shall bind him down to wretchedness and shame. The world is your kaleidoscope, and the varying combinations of colors, which at every preceding moment it presents to you, are the exquisitely adjusted pictures of your ever-moving thoughts. You will be what you will to be. Let failure find its false content. In that poor world environment, but spirit scores it and is free. It masters time, it conquers space. It cows the boastful trickster chance, and bids the tyrant circumstance uncrown and fill a servant's place. The human will, that force unseen, the offspring of a deathless soul, can hew a way to an goal, though walls of granite intervene. Be not impatient in delay, but wait as one who understands. When spirit rises and commands, the gods are ready to obey. Section 3. Effects of Thought on Health and the Body The body is the servant of the mind. It obeys the operations of the mind, whether they be deliberately chosen or automatically expressed. At the bidding of unlawful thoughts, the body sinks rapidly into disease and decay. At the command of glad and beautiful thoughts, it becomes clothed with youthfulness and beauty. Disease and health, like circumstances, are rooted in thought. Sickly thoughts will express themselves through a sickly body, Thoughts of fear have been known to kill a man as speedily as a bullet, and they are continually killing thousands of people just as surely, though less rapidly. The people who live in fear of disease are the people who get it. Anxiety quickly demoralizes the whole body and lays it open to the entrance of disease, while impure thoughts, even if not physically indulged, will soon shatter the nervous system. Strong, pure, and happy thoughts build up the body in vigor and grace. The body is a delicate and plastic instrument, which responds rapidly to the thoughts by which it is impressed, and habits of thought will produce their own effects, good or bad, upon it. Men will continue to have impure and poisoned blood as long as they propagate unclean thoughts. But of a clean heart comes a clean life and a clean body. Out of a defiled mind proceeds a defiled life and a corrupt body. Thought is the fount and action, life and manifestation, Make the function pure, and all will be pure. Change of diet will not help a man who will not change his thoughts. When a man makes his thoughts pure, he no longer desires impure food. Clean thoughts make clean habits. The so-called saint who does not wash his body is not a saint. He who has strengthened and purified his thoughts does not need to consider the malevolent microbe. If you would perfect your body, guard your mind. If you would renew your body, beautify your mind. Thoughts of malice, envy, disappointment, despondency, rob the body of its health, and grace. A sour face does not come by chance. It is made by sour thoughts. Wrinkles that mar are drawn by folly, passion, pride. I know a woman of 96 who has the bright, innocent face of a girl. 
I know a man well under middle age whose face is drawn into in harmonious contours. The one is the result of a sweet and sunny disposition, the other is the outcome of passion and discontent. As you cannot have a sweet and wholesome abode unless you admit the air and sunshine freely into your rooms, so a strong body and a bright, happy, or serene countenance can only result from the free admittance into the mind of thoughts of joy and good will and serenity. On the faces of the aged there are wrinkles made by sympathy, others by strong and pure thought, and others are carved by passion. Who cannot distinguish them? With those who have lived righteously, age is calm, peaceful, and softly mellowed, like the setting sun. I have recently seen a philosopher on his deathbed. He was not old except in years. He died as sweetly and peacefully as he had lived. There is no physician like cheerful thought for dissipating the ills of the body. There is no comfort to compare with good will for dispersing the shadows of grief and sorrow. To live continually in thoughts of ill will, cynicism, suspicion, and envy is to be confined in a self-made prison hole. But to think well of all, to be cheerful with all, to potentially learn to find the good in all, such unselfish thoughts are the very portals of heaven. And to dwell day by day in thoughts of peace towards every creature will bring abounding peace to their possessor. Section 4. Thought and Purpose Until thought is linked with purpose, there is no intelligent accomplishment. With the majority, the bark of thought is allowed to drift upon the ocean of life. Aimlessness is a vice, and such drifting must not continue for him who would steer clear of catastrophe and destruction. Those who have no central purpose in their life fall an easy prey to petty worries, fears, troubles, and self-pitying, all of which are indications of weakness which lead just as surely as deliberately planned sins, though by a different route, to failure and happiness and loss for weakness cannot persist in a power-evolving universe. A man should conceive of a legitimate purpose in his heart and set out to accomplish it. He should make this purpose the centralizing point of his thoughts. It may take the form of a spiritual ideal, or it may be a worldly object, according to his nature at the time of being. Whichever it is, he should steadily focus his thought forces upon the object he has set before him. He should make this purpose his supreme duty and should devote himself to its attainment not allowing his thoughts to wander away into ephemeral fancies, longings, and imaginings. This is the royal road to self-control and true concentration of thought. Even if he fails again and again to accomplish his purpose, as he must until weakness is overcome, the strength of character gained will be the measure of his true success, and this will form a new starting point for future power and triumph. Those who are not prepared for the apprehension of a great purpose should fix their thoughts upon the faultless performance of their duty, no matter how insignificant their task may appear. Only in this way can the thoughts be gathered and focused, and resolution and energy be developed, which being done, there is nothing which may not be accomplished. The weakest soul knowing its own weakness and believing this truth, that strength can only be developed by effort and practice, will, thus believing, at once begin to exert itself, and, adding effort to effort, patience to patience, and strength to strength, will never cease to develop, and will at last grow divinely strong. As the physically weak man can make himself strong by careful and patient training, so the man of weak thoughts can make them strong by exercising himself in right thinking. To put away aimlessness and weakness, and to begin to think with purpose, is to enter the ranks of those strong ones who will only recognize failure as one of the pathways to attainment who make all conditions serve them, and who think strongly, attempt fearlessly, and accomplish masterfully. Having conceived of his purpose, a man should mentally mark out a straight pathway to his achievements, looking neither to the right nor left. Doubts and fears should be vigorously excluded. They are disintegrating elements which break up the straight line of effort, rendering it crooked, ineffectual, useless. Thoughts of doubt and fear never accomplish anything, and never can, they always lead to failure. Purpose, energy, power to do, and all strong thoughts cease when doubt and fear creep in. The will to do springs from the knowledge that we can do. Doubt and fear are the great enemies of knowledge, and he who encourages them, who does not slay them, thwarts himself at every step. He who has conquered doubt and fear has conquered failure. His every thought is allied with power and all difficulties are bravely met and wisely overcome. His purposes 
are seasonably planted, and they bloom and bring forth fruit that does not fall prematurely to the ground. Thought allied fearlessly to purpose becomes creative force. He who knows this is ready to become something higher and stronger than a bundle of wavering thoughts and fluctuating sensations. He who does this has become the conscious and intelligent wielder of his mental powers. Hey guys, thanks for sticking around to the end of this episode. I'd like for you to do me a favor. I want you to go down into the description and click on those links to get your free money. What I want you to do is sign up for Webull and Robinhood. These are online free trading accounts that allow you to buy and sell stocks. And by doing so, by funding your free account with $100 or more, Webull and Robinhood will give you two free stocks each. That's free cash money with no obligation. You can turn around and instantly sell those stocks and take that money home for yourself, or you can start your journey with investing. When you go down to the description and get your free stocks, Webull and Robinhood will also give me two free stocks, which will go directly to supporting and funding this channel and the content I try to create. It's a win-win situation, and I would really appreciate your support in this way. Thanks again for sticking around, and I'll see you next time.